sounded good. Thank you for joining in and praising and worshiping our Savior. What a, what a privilege, what an opportunity we have each, each day and certainly on Sunday to, to worship and praise our Lord. Amen. And we want to do that all the time and certainly when it comes to our song service and you're doing great. I appreciate it so much. I heard about a preacher who decided to get really bold and aggressive in his witnessing. He uh, just felt like he'd been slack on it, and so he was just determined to, uh, to be aggressive, and he decided to attack the devil on his own turf. So it was an evening, and he just decided he was waiting no longer, and he went to a bar. And he walked in there, and the first man he saw, he just went up to him and said, you want to go to heaven? And the guy said, yeah. He said, well, then you get up and you go over to that wall and you stand over at that wall right over there. The pastor was surprised. The guy got up, went over and stood at the wall. Preacher liked that. He went over to another guy. You want to go to heaven? The guy said, yeah. He said, well, then you go stand with that man right over there at that wall. I'll be with you all in a minute. He went to another. You want to go to heaven? Yes, yes. Well, then you go stand with those two men over there. And he went through, he got a little group over there. And he went to another guy and he said, you want to go to heaven? The guy said, no. Preacher said, are you serious? You don't want to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh, when I die? Oh, yeah, when I die. I thought you was getting a group together tonight. <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm ready to go today. Well, the world keeps getting into such a mess. Get your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 10. I'm just, I'm just excited because I do believe the Lord's coming back soon. And I believe we're going to be raptured out of here. And uh, I, I, I am just so looking forward to it. I'm getting more excited the more I think about it, meditate on it, read about it, study about it. You know, if you were to travel, Romans 10, by the way, if I, I think I said that, Romans 10. If you were to travel around the world and you were to ask this question, all around the world, different continents, different cities, you were to ask, what is the greatest need of mankind today? I believe you would get all sorts of answers according to where you are, according to what's going on. See, I, I believe some would say education is the greatest need. Others would say world peace is the greatest need. Some might say uh, stronger families or stronger churches. Some people might say food. I mean, food is the greatest need. We need to make sure everybody's got food. There's people starving to death. And some people might say, no, it's, it's water. If we just had fresh water, that's the greatest need uh, in the world today, and, and these are legitimate. These are oftentimes desperate needs, and there's no doubt about that. But I don't believe it's the greatest need. I believe the Bible gives us a, a strong teaching on what is the greatest need, and one of the ways the Bible teaches it through questions. Mark eight thirty six says, What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, we could stop right there and we could put all of those things that we listed. World peace. Would you trade world peace for your soul? I wouldn't. Would you trade water for your soul? I wouldn't. And trust me, I drink a lot of water. And I'm thankful it's fresh, good water. But I wouldn't trade that for my soul, I'll tell you that. I wouldn't trade food. I wouldn't trade strong families. I wouldn't trade strong churches or anything else. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world, everything, and lose his own soul? Another question that comes up, Hebrews 2, chapter 3, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There's the key. There's the most important need in the world today is this great salvation it is certainly the greatest need and that's what I want to preach on this morning this great salvation and you have an outline on the back of your bulletin follow along fill in the blanks but right now let's stand as I begin reading Romans 10 and uh, Romans 10 and I'll begin reading with verse 1 uh and David, we got one string of lights here we need to turn on. Romans 10, 1. 
Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Father, we just turn the remainder of this service over to you. We ask for your blessing. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your presence in a special way. If there's anyone lost, I pray they'll come to know you as Savior and Lord. We thank you for this great salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Without a doubt, salvation is man's greatest need. To be saved is, a. some would say that's old-fashioned terminology. That's outdated. But I believe that it is, I don't think God's word changes. It's the same. God doesn't change. Uh, we talked about that, absolute truth, last week. And it's not outdated whatsoever. It's Satan wants us to think that it's outdated to talk about salvation and to make a decision and, and uh, absolute truth concerning that. He, he, he's behind that. You know, when the people sailed on the Titanic, there were all different types of people. There were, there were some upper echelon people. There were wealthy people. There were poor people. There were working people. There were all types of people that sailed the first and last uh, sailing on that on that ship. But when it was all said and done and the final tally came to New York, every single person, regardless of their status in life, was put on one of two columns, saved or lost. Saved or lost, physically. They were either saved or they were lost. Spiritually, every person in the world today is in one of those two columns. Saved or lost? And every person in this room this morning, you're either saved or you're lost. And, and you know, it's not going to be enough that people think I'm saved. One day I'm going to stand before God and it'll all be uncovered. And it's not going to matter. I'm going to be very, very frank with you this morning. It's not going to matter at all about my life what you think. It's going to matter what he says and what he knows. And so we need to make sure, and I guess that my desire this morning is that we all examine our heart, make sure without a shadow of a doubt we do not, do not, do not leave this place until we know for sure we're saved. That's the most important need. It's the most important decision we'll ever make is that we're saved. So I want to share three things with you this morning. Number one, this great salvation is free. This great salvation is free. Cost you nothing. Cost the Lord, but it cost you nothing. It's free. Now, the majority of the people in the world today think that salvation is rooted in the merits of man. I hope you got that because this is a fact. The majority of the world, majority of the world believes that salvation comes according to your works, according to what you do. That, that there's certain things you just have to do. And of course, I, you know, there's, there's all types of beliefs on what you have to do but it's according to works in other words and I've even encountered this uh, much here and we're in the the Bible belt but many people that I've asked do you know for sure you're going to heaven I think so well, well what are you basing it on why do you think why do you think you go to heaven I, I couldn't tell you there's been a lot of people I've asked that and they'll say well because I try to do right works because I try to treat people right. I've had them say that. Works. See, what people are thinking is that if I do more good than I do bad, which I try to do, I'll probably go to heaven. That's the great deception 
And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a little bit. That's the lie from Satan. See, people think that salvation is a reward for the righteous. It's not. Salvation's not a reward for the righteous. It is a gift for the guilty. And that's us. We're guilty. We're lost. We're separated from a holy God. There's people who are going to go to hell. Why? Because they're drunkards? No. Because they're drug addicts? Because they're prostitutes? Because they, they're, they're thieves? Liars? Murderers? Rapists? No. The reason they'll go to hell is because they've never been saved. You see, the Lord died for all of those people. And you and me. And it's a gift. And he wants to give it to everyone. And it's free. It's free to us. If somebody came in here and they said, hey, pastor, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something for your church. I said, well, good, good. He said, I'm going to pay for everybody to go on a cruise and you can all go together as a church. And I just want to do that gift. So if, if you want to go, it's going to be free to you and all expenses. I said, I don't have to pay anything, nothing. Just whoever wants to go. Now, how much is that going to cost you? Nothing. It's free. That ain't going to happen, by the way. Y'all settle down. I see people just getting all excited about the food on the, on the cruise. But it would be free to you. That's what, that's what the Lord has offered us, except it's eternal life. It's forgiveness of sin. It's free. It's free. But yet so many will not accept it. How sad it is when they won't believe they want it receive. Hebrew, Hebrews 11, verse 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The apostle Paul was a religious guy. He, he was Saul, of course, before he became the apostle Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus. And, and this is where so many people are today. They're just religious you know, a lot of people in the world today would put you and me to shame as far as religious religiosity. I mean, they just, boy, they're, they're much more fervent and faithful than we are, yet they believe a lie. They're counting on their own righteousness. It's exactly what Paul is talking about in the scripture. And, and, and Saul, Paul, actually Paul, said this. Matter of fact, let's read it. If you would, put a bookmark in Romans 10, and I want, I want you to turn there because I want you to see this. In Philippians 3. Philippians in the New Testament. A few books further. Philippians 3. Paul was a religious guy. And he says this. You want to you compare resumes? I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any of you. I, I was the most religious of anybody. I think, so, I think he was saying, I didn't know anybody was more religious than me. I mean, I don't know anybody that was more fervent, more passionate about their religion than, than me. Look at verse 4, Philippians 3. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, in Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Man, I, I was above all of you when it comes to religion. And I can't help but as I look at this and I, and I think about what Paul was trying to get across, I can't help but think about the Mormons. They're, boy, they're fervent in what they believe. They're working hard to get to heaven. I think of the Jehovah Witnesses. I think of the Buddhists and uh, the Hindus. And I think of, of uh, the, the, the Islam religion. These people are serious, man. I'm telling you, they're, they're not playing around. They're not playing church. They're serious with what they believe. Religious. But that's what Paul is addressing it's not enough. So we look a little further. What did, what did Paul do with it? Look at verse 7. 
what things were gained to me, I counted loss. All that religious stuff, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that, that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You want to get in a bragging contest, Paul says, I'll go with you. I'll, 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 I'll go toe-to-toe with you any day. But I count all that nothing. It's, it's nothing that I may win Christ. Somebody says, but, but preacher, isn't those, aren't those things important? I mean, that we serve, that we do, that we work, that we live and do all these good things and good deeds. Isn't that important? I mean, don't they count on the right side of the ledger that it's, it's, you know, it's all going to be good for us? You know what? There again is the great lie of Satan because that's what people are counting on. And so actually it's not good if it's going to keep you from heaven, keep you from coming to Christ. So many religious people, again, fervent in their belief, passionate about what they believe, but lost. Why? Because they're believing a lie. Satan loves that. And so the Bible's clear. It's not by works of righteousness which you've done, but according to his mercy, he saves you. Not of works lest any man should boast. All these works, you need to get rid of those works and come to Christ. You need to get rid of the religion and come to Christ. That's what's tripping people up. I really believe that. And I don't think you have to go to all the cults and isms to find it. You can find it right in churches, even in Baptist churches today. People are believing that they're good works. I go to church. I I, I tithe or give. I serve. I'm more faithful than most people. So if, if anybody's going to go, I think I will. I know I'm in the upper group. Folk, folks, that's a lie from Satan. He loves that. He wants us to believe that even in our churches, in our Christian churches. You say, well, so works are not important? Not until you get saved. Works are not important? Not until you get saved. Not until you get saved. Get saved, and then what you do counts for Christ. Yes, then we need to get busy. Once we get saved, we come to Christ, and we need to get to work, and we need to serve. John Patton was a missionary in the South Sea Islands, and and he was working with a tribe, and they didn't have a Bible, and he wanted to translate into their language, and he, and he worked fervently at that. As anybody's taken that undertaking, it's very difficult. Um, there was a word that he had to translate correctly and he didn't have one. He asked a number of the tribe, tribal people and they didn't, you know, all they would do, it was, the, it was the word for trust and faith and belief where you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only word they had really was an intellectual belief. That's all he could come up with. You know, you put two apples here and you add two more, that's four apples, that's an intellectual belief. And so this went on and on, and he had to come up with you can't give the south you can't give the gospel without this. So finally there was a, a guy that had been running, one of the tribesmen that was running, he was exhausted, he came into the hut where John Patton was and he just fell over on a chair. Just I'm not going to demonstrate it. I wish I could. But he, would just, he just fell over, exhausted, and he was trusting in the chair 100%. And John Patton asked him, now, what, what is that? What is that you just did? You just trusted that church chair. You knew you put 100% into it. You knew it would hold you, and you just totally gave yourself over. What was it? And he gave him a new word he had never heard before. It was the word. What we need to understand We have to trust Jesus Christ 100%. It's not Jesus Christ plus salvation, I mean plus baptism. It's Jesus Christ, period. It's not walking an aisle. 
You see, you ask people that, and then you ask them about their salvation. They say, yeah, I walked the aisle. Well, it's not walking an aisle, folks. It's not walking an aisle. Some people would say, uh, yeah, I, um, I said the prayer. Prayer can't save you. You got to stay with me. You're going to have to stay with me to get this. Prayer can't save you. You say, I'm preacher, you, we're not supposed to pray? Yeah, you should, you should pray. The Bible says, call on the name of the Lord and thou shall be saved. It's important. You, we're not supposed to walk the aisle? Yeah, that's good. Make a public, you do need to make a public profession of faith. But it can't save you. Only Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ can save you. It's faith in him. It's 100% faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's not that plus anything. Salvation is free. Let me move on. I'll never get through. Number two, this great salvation is near. This is exciting. This great salvation is near. Look at verse, you're back in Romans 10. Look at verse six. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It's so close. Salvation is so close. It's right there. It's so close to all the people that are lost. It's so close to the people that are in the church that are lost. It's so close to the people who are around. It's just, it's so close. He says, hey, God doesn't have to do anything. Don't, don't pray he'll come back from heaven so you can be saved. He's already come down from heaven. Don't pray that he'll go up from the grave. He's already done that. He's done everything. It's all completed. Salvation is done. It's done. And it's so close. How close is it? Well, look at verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's how close it is. So what is this confession that you make? What is it? It means taking you off the throne and putting him on the throne. It's putting, again, 100% of your belief and your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. And it's important. You confess him. Notice it says, confess with thy mouth, verse 9, the Lord Jesus. Notice it didn't say Savior. That's interesting. You must confess him as Lord. He is Savior. He saved. He, he did everything that we could. he would be our Savior. But we must confess him, it appears to me, and here and many other places, as Lord. If you don't receive him for who he is, you can't have what he gives. I'm, I'm talking to you about some serious, some serious things this morning. Uh, a, a serious subject. Very, very, very serious. Suppose this was the very last service you'll ever be at. I'll ever be at. Boy, we better do business with the Lord. We better make sure we are, we are saved and not lost. It's, uh, let, let me try to illustrate this. Imagine, imagine this scene. There's been a wedding, beautiful. Everything was great. We'll say Sue and Bill just got married. They had the music. They exchanged their vows. They kissed. They, the preacher announced them. They're, they're man and husband and wife and on and on. Then they had a reception. 
All the confetti's thrown. They walked out. They ran out. They got in their vehicle. Now they're leaving the church. And Bill says to Sue, what do you think? Oh, it was beautiful. It's beautiful. Boy, wasn't that music pretty? Oh, it was gorgeous. I thought everybody looked really nice. Didn't you? Oh, yes. She, Sue says, I believe that's the prettiest wedding I've ever seen. I really do. It was just gorgeous. Everything was perfect. And all of a sudden, she turns to Bill and she says, Bill, thank you. I love you. Now, take me home, would you? Bill says, well, well, our house is not ready yet. It, they're, they're, they're finishing up. should be ready in a few days, but we're going to go on our honeymoon now. She says, no, just, just take me home. What do you, what do you mean I, we, it's not ready? No, I mean home, my home with my mom and my dad. Take me back home. He says, what do you mean? We're, we're married. And Sue says, well, I know, I love you. But take me home. Why would you go back to your mom and your dad? Because that's where I'm going to live. Sue says, don't think anything's going to change just because we got married. I mean, I'll still see you. I love you. I loved you before we got married. I love you now, but nothing's going to change. We're going to, you come see me on the weekends. And we'll date. We'll have a good time. I mean, but don't think I'm changing my life just because we got married. You promised you'd take care of me, and I'm glad you're going to take care of me. I'm, I'm excited about all that. But don't think I'm going to change anything. And you see how absurd that is, right? Did you know that's the way sometimes people are doing God? Hey, I said your prayer. But don't think I'm going to change my life. I said, I love you, Lord. I love you. But I'm still going to do what I want to do. This is how serious this is. If we don't confess him as Lord and believe on him as Lord, we're not going to have what he offers. I think that's one reason. I'm not sure, but maybe that's one reason that some people are going to stand before God and they're going to be shocked. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. But I went to church. I got baptized. I said that prayer. I walked the aisle. I did all these things. What do you mean you don't know me? I don't know you. In other words, you've never been born again. You just said a prayer. You were trusting a prayer. You've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 100%. He must be Savior and Lord of your life. You give him your life. That's what we've got to do. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Confession is essential to, to be saved. Confession shows possession. If we are truly saved, our life's going to be changed and we're not going to be ashamed of him. See, I, I'm afraid that sometimes even church people, we're ashamed of him. We don't even, we don't, we're, we're afraid to even let people know we're Christians, we're born again because we don't know how somebody's going to act about it. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. I heard about a, a revival meeting that was going on and there was a woman in the back who was weeping and one of the counselors saw her and so he went back to the back of the church and he, and he talked to her and he said, would you like to come forward and be saved? She said, no, I don't want to come forward. Don't you want to give your life to Christ? Yeah, if I can do it back here. And the counselor said, you can't do that back here. And he went on back up front. Well, the next night, the same thing happened. Boy, it was a revival meeting. The, the spirit was moving. And, and this same counselor up at the front, and he saw this, this lady back there crying. And so he decided to go back to her, and he went back again. He said, ma'am, don't you want to come forward and believe on the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ and be saved? She said, no, that's embarrassing. Can't I do it back here? He said, no. 
No, you can't do that back here. And he, the counselor went back up front. She didn't, she didn't get saved. The third night of the revival, the same thing happened again. And this counselor started not to go back there, but he noticed this woman was really under conviction. She is just weeping. And so he went back and he, and he asked her again, Ma'am, do you want to go forward and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and get saved? She said, yes, 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 I will. I will. I will do anything if I can just have peace with God. Yes, I'll go forward. He said, okay, then there's no need. You can get saved right here. Folks, that wasn't a trick. That's real. See, she had to come to the place. And when I first heard it, I thought, well, what do you mean she can't? She can get saved right where she is. She can get saved at home or whatever. No, but he knew she's not where she wants to truly 100% believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. She's ashamed. She's embarrassed. No, she wasn't ready to get saved. Maybe therein lies the problem. Some people who are quickly making a, saying a prayer, but they're not really ready. They're not truly ready to believe on him as Savior and Lord. Have you come to that place? It's so close. It's so close. People are so near. Let me give you one more and we're done. Number three, this great salvation is rich. Look at verse 12. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. I'm so thankful for that. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. I'm so thankful for that. For whosoever, verse 13, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm so thankful for that. And I don't believe anyone is predestined to hell. I do not believe anyone is predestined to hell. There's a teaching going around the world today that, that the hyper-Calvinists believe that God picks certain people that can be saved and others he picks that they will be lost. I do not believe that. That's not what the Bible teaches. He said he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, we talk about these people that committed murder or rape or anything. Listen, Jesus died for them. He loves them. Those who are committing the most egregious sins that you can imagine, some things you can't imagine, but God loves them and he wants them to be saved just like he wants everyone to be. There's nobody in this building. You say, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done. Nobody knows what I've done. There's no one in this building who's bad enough that you can't be saved. There's no one in this building who's so good you don't need to be saved. But you must 100% believe on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ for salvation. Let's stand. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Only you know your heart. I don't know your heart. But I know I love you. And I know the Lord Jesus loves you. And I know he died for you. And I know that salvation is so close. Regardless of age, who you are, where you live, what you've done. It's so close. And it's free. And it's wonderful. But you, you must decide for Christ 100%. Would you su submit yourself to God 100%? Would you call on him as not just Savior, but Lord? If you're, if you're here and you, you don't know you're saved, would you come forward, take my hand and let me know I, I don't have a peace about my salvation or I know I'm not saved? Let's get it settled today. Father, bless in this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.